Well, tonight, 77-year-old Donald Trump is asking a court where he appointed three of the nine judges to save his presidential campaign. Donald Trump's lawyers have filed an appeal asking the United States Supreme Court to overturn a decision by the Colorado State Supreme Court to ban Donald Trump from the presidential ballot in Colorado. The Colorado Supreme Court's decision is based on the 14th Amendment, which was ratified in 1868, that does not allow officers of the federal government to be elected to office again if they have engaged in insurrection against the United States. <clears throat> in a 43-page brief asking the Supreme Court to hear the case, the Trump lawyers use less irrelevant Trump campaign rhetoric than appears in most Trump legal filings, possibly in deference to the Supreme Court. The Trump lawyers argue that the President of the United States is not an officer of the United States, states, which therefore exempts, in their view, Donald Trump from any possible sanction under the 14th Amendment. And the Trump lawyers argue, quote, the events of January 6, 2021, were not insurrection, as that term is used in Section 3. Insurrection, as understood <clears throat> at the time of the passage of the 14th Amendment, meant the taking up of arms and waging war upon the United States. Nothing that President Trump did engaged in insurrection. The Colorado Supreme Court, anticipating that argument, cited Attorney General Henry Stanberry's definition of engage at the time the 14th Amendment was being debated. The Colorado Supreme Court wrote, Attorney General Stanberry opined that a person may engage in insurrection or rebellion without having actually levied war or taken arms. Thus, in Attorney General Stanberry's view, when individuals acting in their official capacities act in the furtherance of the common unlawful purpose or do any overt act for the purpose of promoting the rebellion, they have engaged in insurrection or rebellion for Section 3 disqualification purposes. The Colorado Supreme Court also quotes Attorney General Stanberry saying, when a person has, by speech or by writing, incited others to engage in rebellion, he must come under the disqualification. The words of the 14th Amendment that are never quoted by the Trump lawyers in their Supreme Court brief are aid or comfort. Prohibition on holding office applies to those who engage in insurrection and those who give them, quote, aid or comfort, according to the 14th Amendment. Maine's Secretary of State, Shanna Bellows, noted in her decision banning Donald Trump from the presidential ballot in Maine that Donald Trump gave the attackers of the Capitol aid and comfort during the attack by doing absolutely nothing to stop the attack and by telling the attackers that he loved them. Secretary Griswold, thank you very much for joining us tonight uh, in what uh, appears to be clearly a historic situation for you as a Secretary of State. Uh, I just want to go through some dates before we get to the merits of what's being considered by the Supreme Court. Uh, January 5th, the end of this week, Friday, is that, as I understand it, is your deadline for, in effect, deciding what names will be on the primary ballot. That's right. And so what what does this situation mean, uh, given that this appeal process is underway? Does that mean, because of the appeal process, Donald Trump's name will be on the ballot? That's exactly right. The Colorado Supreme Court determined that Trump did engage in insurrection, and because of that, he is disqualified from the ballot. But their decision stated that if an appeal was filed before today, uh, he would be on the ballot until the Supreme Court took some type of action. So you have to go to the printers and uh, get these ballots printed, all of that. And that basically has to start happening two months before 
your March 5th election day, the primary election day? On Friday, I certify the candidates who can be placed onto the ballot, and then the county clerks will start printing the ballots next week. Colorado, of course, we have some of the best elections in the country, and that includes early voting in person, but also mail balloting. Uh, and then ballots for overseas and military voters will go out actually this month. So it's a quickly approaching timeline. I do hope that the Supreme Court acts with urgency uh, because Lawrence, frankly, the American people deserve to know whether a president can engage in insurrection and then be qualified once again to hold that office. Uh, as in what you see in Donald Trump's uh, petition to the Supreme Court, is there anything there uh, in their petition that uh, shapes your view of this case as opposed to the Colorado Supreme Court's view of the case? I would qualify it as more of the same, uh, more of the same to a large extent uh, lies that we've heard since 2020. Donald Trump is trying to argue he did not incite an insurrection. Well, two Colorado courts at this point have determined that he did. Uh, and then Trump goes on to argue that even if he did incite the insurrection, well, the Constitution doesn't apply to him. I don't think that's right. Uh, I don't think that there's some get-out-of-jail-free card for the presidency that allows Donald Trump to escape uh, scrutiny uh, of the laws of the land and the Constitution. So I, I do think it's important for the United States Supreme Court to act quickly even if that action is determining that they will not review the case. That, in effect, would uh, uh, basically put Colorado Supreme Court's case in, in full uh, power and, and would disqualify the former president. The uh, Trump lawyers have pages of detailed complaints about the process in the Colorado courts, especially the uh, district court before it got uh, to the Supreme Court of Colorado, talking about procedural deadlines that weren't enforced uh, in, in that. Uh, what do you see in their description uh, of the procedures that brought this case to the Colorado Supreme Court? This case was brought to the Colorado Supreme Court actually by six Colorado voters who are Republican and unaffiliated voters uh, who want to ensure that the, the candidates that appear on their primary ballot are eligible candidates. And I'll tell you something that was very striking to me uh, in the, the district court case, so the first trial, was that Donald Trump didn't show up. You would think if someone was accusing you of engaging in an insurrection and putting your whole presidential uh, campaign in peril, that you would have at least uh, an hour to show up, even remotely. He failed to do that. Uh, I, I think, you know, we are seeing the effects of that. I, I'm not part of his legal team, obviously, but I would have advised my candidate, candidate to show up. Uh, do, do you recognize the possibility that in the uh, 50 United States with 50 different secretaries of state, uh, 50 different Supreme Courts in, in the United States, that, they, that different states could reasonably end up with different opinions about this? That could happen. Every state has different laws on the books, different procedures. Some states allow disqualified or unqualified candidates onto their presidential primaries. States like Colorado, we do not allow that. And that's why I think it's so important for the Supreme Court to step in. Uh, you know, this is a big question. It's novel. It's unprecedented. Because usually we do not have presidents trying to steal the presidency. Usually, we do not have people who engage in insurrection run for president. But now that we do, I do think it's important for the Supreme Court to act quickly. I filed a brief yesterday urging their expediency, um, and I, I hope that they will do exactly that. Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold in the center of history tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And I want to begin with your reaction to what we just heard from the State Department in what is the most striking public uh, conflict the State Department has had with Israel so far. 
Yeah, Lawrence, it's good to be with you uh, all the way from New Zealand, in fact. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't um, I think this is a, a lasting problem. I think um, these statements by Smotrich and Ben Gvir are, are representative of, of a far-right faction uh, in Netanyahu's government. Uh, his own government, uh, Netanyahu himself, has um, uh, disassociated himself from that view. Um, these guys and this government is, is capable of many crazy things. Um, uh, but I don't think um, forcing Gazan civilians out of Gaza is anything that it will uh, actually implement. So uh, I'm glad the State Department drew a red line, um, but uh, I don't think it's something um, you know that, that we're going to see. But it's emblematic, you know, Lawrence, of of this war. What is what is new about it is that um, on both the Israeli and Palestinian side, um, you have the worst of the worst. Um, uh, really in the driver's seat. Uh, on the Palestinian side, you not only have the worst of, um, you know, of the Palestinian political movement, which is the, the military um, leadership of Hamas driving this, because Hamas has a you know, certain number of pragmatists. This is, this is the worst of the worst of Hamas driving it from its side. And on the Israeli side, you have a prime minister who um, uh, has a broad cabinet now with many moderates in it, but is captive of the worst of the worst from the Israeli side. And, and that's one of the things that's concerned me from the very beginning. Uh, you make the point in your column that uh, the, the best move Israel can make now is to get out of Gaza, cease fire, get out. Uh, and once Israel is out of Gaza, only then can the Palestinian people in Gaza hold Hamas responsible for what's happening day to day in Gaza. Well, you know, that uh, that advice, alas, Lawrence, is, has not been and I don't think is going to be taken. My my, my concern is this, that um, and it's been my concern from the very beginning. What is the end game for Israel? Um, uh, is it a permanent occupation of Gaza uh, or is it um, trying to partner with a reformed um, uh, transformed uh, Palestinian authority um, uh, you know, to put it in place in Gaza to replace Hamas. And so if the choice is uh, Israel uh, permanently controlling Gaza or, or uh, Hamas at this stage, um, if I were Israel, I, I would want Hamas having the responsibility for, for rebuilding the place. If the choice is um, Israel paving the way for a transformed Palestinian authority um, uh, running Gaza after Israel defeats Hamas. That is, I think, much preferable for the Palestinian people, for Israel, and for American interests. The, uh, when President Biden went to Israel, in his speech, we heard the phrase two-state solution, which had become uh, almost extinct in the language of, of the, the conflict there over the years. It, it, and and uh, the, the Netanyahu administration uh, seemed to willfully drive that phrase out of usage and out of the realm of possibility. Yeah, um, you know, this is uh, obviously a story we can't tell in, in two minutes on TV. Um, there have been many lost opportunities uh, on both sides. Um, but, you know, from Netanyahu's point of view, he did everything he could um, uh, during his 16 years now in power to strengthen Hamas uh, in Gaza, to weaken the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Remember, the Palestinian Authority has embraced Oslo. Uh, Hamas has rejected it. So he could basically say, I have no Palestinian partner. And um, that was a deliberate strategy and, and um, unfortunately it blew up here. Tom, I, I'd like to widen the lens in the, in the minutes we have left to your uh, column that you titled, What is Happening to Our World? And it's classic Friedman because, for me because it reaches beyond a single issue. It reaches beyond a single spot on this planet and links up uh, the challenges and the tensions we face from Israel, Gaza to Ukraine, Russia, China. Uh, as we go forward in 2024, what do you think, how do you think this audience should be seeing these challenges? Um, thanks, Lawrence, it's, and it's an important question. You know, I go back really, Lawrence, to October 6th. What was going on in the world the day before this Hamas attack? I think two big things were happening in the world. One is Ukraine was struggling to join the West struggling to join the European Union and NATO. I think Israel 
was attempting to join the East, that is through a process of normalization with Saudi Arabia. And I think Russia and Iran and their and Iran's proxies in the regions, in the region, tried to block both. Um, uh, Russia does not want to see Ukraine joining the West, um, and uh, Israel. Uh, Saudi, sorry, Iran did not, and its proxies didn't want to see Israel joining the East and normalizing. And so, what you really see in the region, Lawrence, is a struggle basically between two coalitions. One is the coalition of resistance led by Iran with its what I call landcraft carriers. Um, these are the militias of, uh, of the Houthis, Hamas, Hezbollah, and Islamic militias in Iraq, through which Iran projects its power in the region. And its goal is resistance to Israel, to America, uh, to Western influence, to democratic influence. And basically, it says to its people, judge me, all of these groups, judge me on how I resist you know, the Americans, Israel, et cetera. They're up against a whole different coalition. I call them the coalition of resilience. This is, you know, the UAE, uh, now Saudi Arabia, um, uh, 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 Jordan. These are leaders who say, actually, judge me on whether I'm building resilience for my people for the 21st century, education, environment, um, uh, economic skills, jobs, et cetera. That's the struggle going on in the region. And, um, uh, and Israel is on the side of, of the resilience um, uh, coalition. But obviously, Israel itself is divided uh, between a far-right group um, uh, that wants to resist, you know, a future of integration. And I still think the majority of Israelis who want to be part of that, you know, resilience coalition. But th that's the struggle here. That's why Ukraine matters. That's why Gaza matters. Hamas is a terrible organization. First and foremost, Lawrence, for the Palestinian people, okay, because its rule in Gaza since 2007 has been a disaster for the people of Gaza. And it had choices, and it made terrible choices for the Palestinian people. At the same time, Israel has a minority, a far-right minority, that has captured, captured the prime minister, that wants to impose terrible choices on Israeli society. Unfortunately, Israel's Supreme Court stepped in a couple of days ago to to, to push back on one of those choices, which was a judicial coup. So, you know, that's what I'm trying to navigate here. But there's something really important here about the, the world. There are forces of integration and there are forces of disintegration. And this war and the Ukraine war are, are part of both. And they matter. And who wins here matters. And how they win matters also.